Okay, it's not. Where's the microphone? Okay. Is that now? Oh yeah, there we go. So, hello. Um, still, good morning, um, and thank you for coming. I'm I'm sorry that there, so many people left outside. So. We're going to get underway. It's 10 minutes early, but since we're all here, let's use the extra time. Um, my name is Daniel Howden. I'm the managing director of Lighthouse Reports. Um, Lighthouse is uh, a European investigative newsroom. Um, our team is made up of different kinds of specialists from um, orthodox investigative reporters to um, a data scientists some open source investigators, money trail investigators. We are a, an interdisciplinary investigations team um, and our work um, reaches the public through mainly Euro leading European media outlets. So traditionally we collaborate with others um, and one of our regular partners is Bellingcat. Um, so we're gonna talk to you today about um, a year-long project um, that we're coming up on the midway point on that Lighthouse and Bellingcat have been working on together. Um, this is <coughs> this is um, this is going to be one of these uh, projects where we can talk about um, some of it, but it's it's still at the midway point. So. Uh, we're not going to be able to draw definitive conclusions about what we're doing, but we're going to try to give you as much insight as we can into what's happening um, inside this, uh, inside the broader investigation project. Now, we chose to tackle the topic of QAnon in Europe. Um, now, as many of you will know, it's a substantial period of time has passed um, since the last Q drop, um, and theoretically, QAnon should have come to a conclusion. Um, instead of that being the case, Q is um, Q and Q communities are all are popping up and are active um, all over Europe, um, and offer an opportunity to understand better what's happening with viral conspiracy theories, how they travel, um, how they mutate how they interact with conspiracies which were already present um, in the countries which we're looking at. Now this is a, this project spans seven countries um, and a whole host of different investigative approaches. Um, and the products that come out of this reflect that kind of, uh, of range of, of ambitions and different ways to engage the public policy makers um, and everything right up to and including potentially victims groups um, from some of the real world harms that come about through QAnon. Um, joining me on, on the panel um, this morning, we have, we have um, two colleagues uh, from Bellingcat. We have Anik, who is a trainer researcher um, with Bellingcat. Um, we have Ross um, as well, another trainer researcher with Bellingcat. And we have Gabriel, who is an investigative reporter um, with Lighthouse Reports. Um, we're going to also get a short um, contribution from, from Logan Williams, um, who is the lead data scientist on this project and who's gonna talk about um, some of the longer term potential outputs from this that could really help us in our understanding of, of how Q is working in Europe and what this can tell us about society's vulnerability to disinformation. Um, now, we're gonna start this morning with some of the questions that I imagine some of you have coming into the room. Um, one of the biggest questions is why, why is QAnon such an important topic, given that we said that Q has not dropped um, for a long time, why is it still a live topic um, that two different organizations should spend a year um, looking into. Um, and I'm gonna to turn to, um, to Ross um, to, to get us underway. Hi everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for, for attending this. It's, it's really nice to see people um, in real life as opposed to uh, Zoom. Um, so, so thank you very much for that. Um, 
to answer the question, why are we looking into this? Why is this still relevant? Um, the, the basic answer to that is that um, QAnon and its adjacent conspiracy theories um, have real world, world uh, consequences. Um, many of you would have seen the performance, uh, for example, um, at the UN by the, by the Russian ambassador. And um, what you'll see are terms like false flag, you'll see stories about bioweapons, um, plagues of flying birds and bats and, and um, all of this kind of thing. Um, you'll see the, the same theories on the uh, social media channels um, that we're looking at as part of the Q project. Um, the language of, of QAnon and conspiracy theories um, is starting to find its way into the corridors of power. Um, the, other, the other aspect of this is that it does influence the way that people uh, behave. Um, the communities that we're looking at, um, we see telegram channels that have 100,000 followers. Um, they, 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 follow, they follow issues such as uh, uh, COVID, for example. Um, the, reason that, um, the reason that people you know may not be taking their vaccinations or may be putting themselves at risk is because they've um, involved themselves in uh, these QAnon conspiracy groups. Um, we, see, um, we see examples like the uh, shooter in Christchurch in New Zealand, for example. Who, uh, who killed 51 people. Um, he was a regular on 4chan and uh, 8chan or 8kun as, uh, as it's also known. So, um, I mean, we have to get away from this idea that these are kind of obscure little conspiracy theories in, in the dark corners of the internet and we should kind of disregard this because it's, it's, it's just a bunch of uh, weirdos. Um, you know, this is uh, this is very widespread. Um, they're very well organised. Um, they're they're posting over a, a variety of social media platforms, and um, I think the mistake that's been made in the past is that we've looked at forums like 4chan, and we've kind of discredited how how influential they are. Um, after four years of Trump and after the the um, storming of the Capitol. This is an issue that we need to take a little bit more seriously. Um, so, um, so yeah, this is this is why we're why we're looking into this. I mean, the other aspect as well is that um, in the course of our research, we found that people are posting on way more social media platforms than we first anticipated. Um, newer social media platforms, uh, maybe more obscure social media platforms. Um, that from an investigative point of view, we actually know um, very little about. Um, I mean, Logan's going to talk about the, the technical aspects of this, um, but from a research point of view, um, we really want to get a grip of some of these lesser known platforms, uh, platforms like Getter and, and Rumble and uh, Odyssey, because as these people are being purged from the more, more mainstream social media sites, um, we are finding them appearing and these communities appearing um, on, these, on these more obscure platforms. Um, I think it benefits everybody if we shine a light on this and we, um, we find out what these people are discussing because the conspiracy theories that they're discussing, discussing now um, are going to emerge in real life down the road. Thanks. Thanks for us. Um, that deals a little bit of the question of why QAnon. Um, Gabriel, I'm going to come to you next. Um, what I really appreciate you discussing is, um, is why this is valid for Europe. And I think a good way um, potentially to begin that it would be, um, and also taking advantage of the fact of you being an American on this panel, um, is if you could tell us a little bit for people in the room who are, many of you are, will assume, are pretty familiar with the origins of the QAnon theory, um, what, it's, uh, what were the early tenets of that theory, how it's evolved a little bit. Um, but Gabriel, if I could ask you to, to discuss for the group a little bit why Europe, um, but also give us a refresher on, on Q where it comes from, what were its main features before 
it traveled over to Europe. And then tell us a little bit about maybe why it's relevant to Europe um, at this moment. Sure, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, sure, so um, QAnon started on 4chan where um, an anonymous user called Q was posting Q drops, which was supposedly insider information about um, a deep state and people fighting the deep state, and the idea was Donald Trump was the one fighting the deep state. Um, of course, over, eventually that would manifest in the Capitol Hill riots where there was the famous pictures of the QAnon shaman running around in the Capitol building. Um, in terms of, uh, so as Daniel said, it's been two years since Q, uh, there was the last Q drop. Um, and yet in, in Europe especially, we've still continue to see a barrage of Q content and there's something sort of odd and uh, unnerving even to see two years after the Capitol Hill riots, Italian groups with 40,000 members continuing this obsession with Trump and QAnon and German and Dutch, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of why, um, why, we, why we're looking at this in Europe is, um, I think part of the reason is there's a complacency in Europe around conspiracy theories and conspiracy theory rhetoric. You have events that are visually and symbolically similar to the Capitol Hill, like the storming of the CGIL uh, Union in Italy, that get a fraction of the coverage. Part of what we're doing is trying to uh, highlight um, the growing spread of conspiracies like QAnon. Um, to fight this complacency. Um, we've, there's a tendency in the European media to report on conspiracy-related events as siloed or not connected to larger infrastructures of conspiracy theories in Europe. Um, I'll give an example. In the Netherlands, uh, there's a graveyard, um, and there's a conspiracy theory about this graveyard uh, that uh, two children who were murdered there um, were murdered by a, a group of uh, satanic pedophiles. Um, and so people go and leave, continue to leave flowers at these graves and it's become, uh, and, and the parents of, of these children have continued to be harassed, but you don't really see this story reported in the larger context of QAnon and the spread of QAnon um, in Europe. The other reason why we think it's interesting is a very distinctly American conspiracy theory seems to be very virulent in, in Europe. Um, so in that sense, it's a good microcosm to explore why does QAnon seem to be such a resilient um, uh, conspiracy theory? Why does it seem to be such a transnational conspiracy theory? But also how can we see how this transnational conspiracy theory is expressed within very distinct local contexts throughout Europe? Um, so, of course, Germany and Italy have different um, conspiracy communities, different traditional conspiracy theories. How does QAnon interact with those um, traditional communities? How does it morph alongside them? How does it colonize them in some cases? Um, so that's why we've teamed up with seven researchers around Europe to try to answer those questions. We've tried to answer why it seems that in some countries in Europe, QAnon seems to take off, in other countries it doesn't. Um, so in that sense, there's a comparative element as well that Europe, um, that Europe is a good setting to explore. Um, so yeah, that's the main reasons. Thanks, thanks Gabriel. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, why QAnon is a, a big enough and important enough topic um, to be pursuing. Um, with, uh, with this kind of time scale and, um, and the two organizations. Um, we've also talked now a little bit about um, how Q has evolved and why it's relevant in Europe, what it might be able to tell us um, about, um, about disinformation in the European setting. Um, we're not gonna get quite to the methods yet, but I think it would be um, it would be interesting to hear from, from Anique a little bit um, about why, we're, why and how we're taking this cross-border approach. Um, now, 
having, um, having researchers in, so in seven different countries um, means that we're able to pick out some of the evolved elements um, of what is, what is really an incredibly baroque um, family of theories which are um, which can fit into Q. Um, one of the complications for this project has been really coming up with useful definitions of what is Q, because it's it's not it's not a fixed point. It's something that uh, um, that evolves over time. Um, so so far we've kind of skirted around around the rabbit hole. I'm going to turn to Anik um, to take you down one one part of that rabbit hole and explain why a cross-border um, approach to doing this um, can then become, why and how it can become really valuable. Um, so, Anik. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon. And it's been a very interesting rabbit hole once you uh, go down into it. So, at the moment, we're looking at the Netherlands, UK, Germany, uh, France, Italy, the Czech Republic, and we're also looking in countries where uh, 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 Russian is widely spoken. Um, and just to give an example uh, for that uh, cross-country research that we're doing, so one of the many things that we ran into is the conspiracy of Nasara or uh, Gazara also, the National Economic Security and Recovery Act, and Gazara is the uh, global variant of it. So a little bit of a background, uh, this was started in the 1990s, and it's a set of proposed economic reforms uh, in the US uh, that would result in zero inflation and uh, make a more stable uh, economy. Uh, the whole idea behind this is there are a lot of precious metals in the world, and if we use those precious metals, everybody could be a multimillionaire. There is no debt in the world. Everything is fine. We'll live in a very happy, rich world together. Well, that's how they try to sell it. Uh, one of the main points that uh, you'll see, it doesn't matter if um, you're looking into Nasara or Gazara, uh, in the Netherlands or in Italy or France, uh, one of the things that they keep saying is the great economic collapse will happen tomorrow. Get rid of your money, Gazara will be there to help you out, uh, and uh, better yet, maybe you should invest in buying Zim dollars from Zimbabwe, uh, the dong uh, or the dinar, because when all those precious metals will help us out, the um, uh, value of that money will rise again, and then all of a sudden you have a Zim dollar of 20 million and you're a millionaire. Uh, and uh, what turns out is I started uh, with this topic with Gabriel uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we reached out to the other uh, investigators, and it turns out there are really big groups of Gazara in Italy, uh, in Germany, uh, in France. Uh, the Dutch people are working together with a YouTuber from the States that's also very popular within the German community. So there is such a big layover between groups um, and people who believe these very interesting um, theories. Um, especially the part when uh, the person in the Telegram chat says, give me your money and I'll take care of the Zim dollars. Better yet, let's start a Dutch cryptocurrency. But just transfer me the money and then we'll make sure that when Gazara comes, I'll buy back the cryptocurrency for a lot more money and you're even richer than all the other 8 billion rich people in the world. It's a very interesting world um, that I've been um, uh, observing the last couple of months. But yeah, this is just a, uh, one example of um, how important the cross-country research is because it isn't just Holland where we have Bode Grave, but also uh, the memorials of Marianne Vaatstra, Nicky Verstappen. Uh, people all of a sudden start laying flowers there because they believe they were uh, killed because they were victim of satanic child abuse. Um, yeah, it happens in a lot of countries, and the research that we're doing is just showing uh, there are no borders, there are no lines, everything fades into uh, another. 
Um, th thanks, Anik. Um, once you start to go into the detail of this, it pretty quickly becomes quite, quite fantastical and by turns also quite fairly horrific. Um, we've talked, we've focused so far mainly on why, why is this such a big, valuable potential topic? Um, why is it a European topic? Because obviously the origins of Q lie in the US and, and as Gabriel has explained, um, uh, they have traveled and they've uh, shifted and evol evolved and adapted um, to the European setting as well. Um, I think you get a little bit of a taste of what it is um, that we do when we're doing, um, why we would take a cross-border approach to looking at this. Um, obviously these are online evolutions and while there are communities within each country, um, there is a massive um, cross-seeding and, um, and cross-hatching of the new and evolving mutating theories going on. So it makes no sense to tackle a topic like this within um, a single country. Um, I think I'd like to move the conversation along a bit to how we go about this. Um, and while we talked a little bit um, in the opening section about uh, what, what Lighthouse is, many of you will of course be familiar with Bellingcat, um, but Ross, I'm gonna come to you and ask you to talk a little bit about how we've been doing this. Um, and maybe I think it would be great to talk um, a little bit um, initially at least just to introduce Bellingcat's um, broader work and give people a sense. Um, some of the research and the things that we're doing here now are, they're not necessarily a big departure from what Bellingcat is known for, but it's, um, I think as we get into how you go about doing this research, I think it'll, make, it'll begin to make sense. So it would be good just to recap for people in the room um, what Bellingcat does and how you work. So where have we been looking um, for Q activity? Um, okay. How have we been, um, how have we been cataloging that? What is it that our researchers are spending our time doing? Obviously, Anik has explained um, um, that they are, um, I mean, from Anik's point of view, it's mainly about getting hold of Zimbabwean dollars, so we know what, um, we know what you've been working on. Um, but Ross, can you tell us a little bit about Bellingcat and take us into the kind of methods? What is, what is the team working on and how are they working? Okay, so um, just to give you a, a broad, broad overview of what Bellingcat is, um, we're, we're, we're essentially an open source investigative um, organization. So um, what we do is um, we investigate a range of subjects, um, but only looking at open sources. So in other words, um, those are sources that are available to the general public. And, and the kind of... Um, the kind of thinking behind that is that um, any investigation that we publish um, can be um, can be replicated by our readers. So um, we're probably we're probably best known for things like uh, investigating the Scripple poisonings and um, investigations surrounding the Syrian civil war. Quite a lot of stuff that's that's focused on uh, various conflicts around the world. Um, now, why we're why we're in a good place to, to investigate QAnon is actually um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, um, we have quite a long history of putting out articles on, um, I guess you'd call them fringe groups on, on the internet. So um, we have a writer who, who looks uh, pretty much exclusively into, into the far right. Um, we have, um, we've written about QAnon before. Um, we're, we're, we're very interested in, in these niche communities. Um, I guess the other reason is that um, quite a few of us, at least the, the senior staff, um, started off when we were in our 20s very immersed in, in internet culture. And um, the, thing about, the thing about QAnon, um, as far as I see, is, is, is effectively, it is a continuation of a, of a culture online that's existed for a, for a very long time. Um, you know, it's counter-cultural, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of dangerous. Um, it, it's, it, it's the sort of thing that's existed on the internet for a very long time and that we're very well versed in. Um, so I think we're well placed to look into this. And the, the other thing as well is that um, all of this behavior that we're looking into is open source. It's, um, it, it's, it's in plain sight 
if you know where to look. Any one of you could, could start a Telegram account um, and start looking into these groups and find all kinds of illicit and, and outright illegal behaviour. So um, it's actually quite straightforward once you understand what the platform forms are to, um, to start looking into this. Um, now, as far as um, how we've dealt with this project, um, I guess the difficulty with QAnon is that it's, it's a, a big top conspiracy theory. So it brings together all kinds of groups on the internet. So on the one hand, you've got your, your kind of um, new age alternative health people. Then you've got your, all the way through to sort of your, your kind of hardcore neo-Nazi people and everything, everything in between. Um, so the, I, I guess the first thing we've come across is, is just the volume of information that's out there. Bear in mind as well that we're looking across um, loads, of, um, loads of alternative social media platforms. Um, so as researchers, we can't possibly monitor all of these sources. Um, and we just don't have the time of the day and we have our sanity to think about as well. So, um, so we've brought in a, a, a data element to this. This is a data-driven project. Um, I mean, Logan will talk about this um, a little bit as well, but broadly speaking, what happens is, is that our researchers um, choose a, a topic within QAnon that they're interested in, and then we go searching for Telegram channels on something like uh, tgstat.com, which is a search engine for Telegram channels, uh, we, we, we might look on some of the more mainstream social media sites like Facebook and Twitter. And then we see who these, um, who these key figures in these groups are interacting with. So we see which groups they're posting to, we see which links they're posting, and then we can build an idea of what platforms they're using. And once we have all of that, once we have a list of Telegram channels, and once we have a list of um, uh, maybe video streaming sites and interesting people and hashtags, we can then take all that information and send it over to our, our, our tech team. And what they can do is um, all the stuff that we're not clever enough to do. So they will, um, they will scrape data. They will start thinking about building tools for some of these um, more obscure alt-media alt sites. Um, in order that we can, um, uh, we can get a more broader view of, of the trends on these sites, um, we can do some analytics, um, we can put some visualizations into, into our articles, and also we can share these tools with, with other people. Um, because our investigations are not the be-all and end-all. Um, a lot of this is about developing tools and also sharing knowledge with people as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the, the methodology. It hasn't been, it, it hasn't been easy. I think, um, I think the plethora of, of conspiracy theories out there is it's a little bit like herding cats. Um, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to narrow things down to, to one or two topics. Um, but I'm quite happy to say that we, we are working on some really, really solid articles and we're, 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 we're learning so much about this, uh, this ecosystem that's out there as well. Um, I think uh, what Ross is um, alluding to there as, as well is that there isn't a single cube place to go and look and um, quite a lot of the time we're looking at different kinds of content and communities and trying to make a decision about exactly how close to Q are they, where on the spectrum um, uh, do they sit. Um, Gabriel, um, you have a slightly different role within, um, within this investigation. You're, you're not attached to a single country as a researcher, and you're frequently following threads which um, go across several different countries or looking for things that might even lie outside of our main target countries but are still in the European sphere. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like you to, um, to explain to people. One is... Uh, Talk a little bit about your, your method, how you address this investigative question, and also how you make a decision about what's relevant, um, what's relevant to this project and what is outside of the outside of the bounds of this. Because one of the one of the major 
the challenges in going down various different rabbit holes is not to get completely lost in this. Um, I, obviously, we are looking at, in many instances, quite vulnerable communities of people who start off um, start off their journey towards kind of radical conspiracy theories with some with some small steps which aren't that different um, to the steps that are taken by researchers and people who've been living their lives in internet cultures um, for a really long time so yeah um, how do you how do you go looking um, and how do you decide when to stop and what amounts to a finding um, can you take people on a little bit of tour of, of, of your method and um, uh, some of the things that you've understood so far? Sure. Um, my method is a little bit different than some of the country researchers. I focus a lot on human stories and human interest stories. So usually my starting point is a little bit different than just going through 40,000 member telegram channels um, in various countries. Um, my starting point has been actually to look at um, channels and groups online, support groups for people who may have lost a family member to QAnon or had a family member or, or loved one who went down the rabbit hole and never came back. Um, through, through that starting point, I've been able to uh, then find things like, for example, groups of people, uh, of, like in, Jassar, in the case of Jasara who are trying to go um, start a commune and trying to raise money to start a commune in the middle of nowhere and uh, raising money for this and it could be a scam. Um, the other thing that I've been uh, quite aware of and, and looking at a lot is the starting point of, um, of financial grifting, so taking advantage of people, trying to raise money that never gets returned um, and looking how this uh, happens across different European contexts. Um, in terms of drawing the line between what <laughs> what is QAnon and what isn't QAnon, that's a tricky question. Um, we've discussed it a lot internally. Um, I have a tendency to fall down <laughs> a lot of weird rabbit holes, as Daniel will probably tell you. Uh, one of the things that's made that question especially difficult has been the pandemic, which has been sort of this flashpoint, I think, that for many people, accelerated a descent down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, but at the same time, it can be difficult when maybe you have a group that posts some QAnon content, but mainly is um, posting anti-vax material or anti-lockdown, and it's difficult to know where, where to draw that line. Um, usually, we have some discussion discussions about it, uh, and of course, there's also the intersection of QAnon with other more extremist far-right groups. Um, and that's also a tricky line to draw. And I don't think there's always an answer. It's something we usually take by a case-by-case -case basis. Um, one one er area that I've been looking at a lot is the intersection between QAnon and alternative health communities, uh, particularly um, one in Eastern Europe where uh, there's, I would call it a Q-adjacent community where they believe that uh, bleach cures autism, so they've been feeding their children bleach and posting pictures of their children shedding their intestinal linings on Telegram. Um, but that's, that's a case where, um, that's an example of one place where it's difficult to know whether you're heading down a rabbit hole that ultimately in the end isn't Q. I mean, if they're posting QAnon content, can you call it a QAnon channel? Can you call it QAnon adjacent? Um, so it's tricky, and I think we're also still all trying to find our way a little bit to understand what type of content and channels actually fits within the, the project description and what type of content is ultimately uh, separate or, or just too Q adjacent. So part of um, what's interesting about the interaction between these two teams um, from Lighthouse and from Bellingcat in, in addressing this topic is that um, we have people with, with very different backgrounds and very different skill sets um, trying to grapple uh, with the questions of what is Q, what is the activity, what does this mean, what's its relevance um, to current events. Um, we have more conventional um, reporters. We have 
specialist in um, in far right traditions um, and therefore in a better position to illuminate the intersection here. Um, but some of the bigger questions that we want to, to grapple with here are not necessarily going to respond to, um, to this kind of handmade approach um, of going out and getting um, specific examples. Um, it's gonna, uh, Ross spoke about it briefly, um, but also in the room with us today, we have the lead data scientist um, who is, who's, whose job it is um, to basically build a database with a vast amount of data that we have identified and defined as Q. Um, so I'd like to invite him up um, just to talk a little bit about that because this is gonna be one of the longer term um, outputs from this project. It's gonna be a database which will um, allow everybody potentially to go in and try to answer some research questions or um, satisfy their own curiosity in some directions. So I would like to introduce um, Logan, Logan Williams from, from Bellingcat. Um, and Logan, if you could just explain to us a little bit, um, we've talked about what the national researchers are doing. They're out there in the Q communities or, and Q adjacent communities online um, and collecting and logging those channels. Um, what, can a, what can a data scientist or a data science team um, do with that data collection um, and how might that help us to answer questions which are, are, are broadly um, are much uh, are broadly more useful Thanks, Daniel. can everyone hear me okay great um, yeah I think that the really important thing to understand here is the scale of some of these social media channels as Ross mentioned earlier it's way more content than any, you know, even team of researchers could hope to look at. Our country researchers on this project have so far identified nearly 1,000 channels on social media where people are discussing this. And some of these QAnon channels are incredibly active, thousands of posts per day. So we really need to take a big data approach to looking at how this information is related to each other and how it's changing as it moves from the United States to Europe and from country to country. So uh, along with uh, two other data scientists on this project, Tristan Lee and Ted Ong from Lighthouse Reports, we've developed a database that is taking channels from the researchers that they've identified as interesting in their countries and scraping those posts and putting them into a format where we can start analyzing it from a data perspective. So far we've uh, scraped 4.7 million posts and this is just from a subset of these 960 channels. So it's, it's an immense amount of content. But one of the things that we can do with this content is we can start breaking it down and looking for keywords we can look at uh, topic modeling and try to see what channels talk about what things. We can see when a topic, you know, maybe takes off, like the so-called bioweapons labs that have become a talking point on the QAnon channels in the past couple of months. These things sometimes start in one country, and then all of a sudden someone translates a post into Italian on an Italian QAnon board, and then it takes off in Italy. So by analyzing the data in a statistical sense, we can make these kind of large-scale inferences about how this movement spreads and changes uh, beyond what is possible by researchers manually reading this because no one can read 4.7 million posts. And Logan, before, um, before I let you um, go and rejoin the audience, um, I think it, it would be interesting, especially for some of the, I guess we probably have um, uh, reporters here in the room, um, and may, maybe not necessarily reporters who are working with um, data teams all of the time. Um, can I ask you to just um, explain a little bit the difference between a kind of, a, let's say, a, a structured research question um, that can be answered quantitatively, um, and the kind of qualitative questions that um, legacy reporters like myself um, would, you know, would uh, traditionally deal with. Um, you, know, you were on a panel yesterday with Julia Angwin from, from the markup and she, she was talking about how um, 
data can help you to, to, uh, to address questions on a different scale. I mean, she gave the example that reporters um, traditionally, the, the scale of the, their data set was the number of people that they could speak to. Um, so I, for our researchers, data is the number of posts and the volume of um, posts that they can read. But um, yeah, if you could unpack for us a little bit um, what a structured research question looks like, because that's been um, something that's been even a surprise to me as we go into this. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good question. And there have been some uh, good examples already discussed. For example, the Gassara Nassara conspiracy theory and the interest in uh, essentially scamming people into purchasing these useless Zim dollars or cryptocurrencies that Anik has discovered. Like, that sort of thing is a question that's very tractable to manual research. You can go in, you can find these posts, you can look at how uh, individuals on these Telegram channels are being encouraged to dump their life savings into these cryptocurrency schemes and that sort of thing. But then, if you want to answer the question, in general, how, how is this movement funded? How is cryptocurrency being used in all of these countries? You need to take a data analysis approach and reframe that as a, a question that's based on data, where you might ask the question, how has the number of cryptocurrency donation addresses in these posts changed over time? Do we see that after for instance, PayPal maybe deplatformed some of these people that were recruiting donations through PayPal, do we see an increase in the number of cryptocurrency addresses that are being posted in these channels? And that is a data question that's related to these manual questions, but requires a kind of different way of, of thinking about it so that it becomes something that's based on statistics and aggregate data rather than anecdotes. But of course, when, when we come to thinking about how this becomes a story and how to publish it and make it relatable to people, it's essential to bring it back to that human level and give the data something to be grounded in with the work that the researchers are doing. Thanks, Logan. Um, it was a bit of a cheat to um, bring you up on stage, so we're grateful for you um, being uh, flexible enough just to jump up and, and talk about things in such a clear way. Um, 4.7 million posts. Now, one individual researcher is not going to make a significant dent in that number, but that's not to say that we don't have researchers within our team um, who are engaging with, at the very least, thousands of posts over hours and days um, and quite often nights as well. Um, Gabriel has given you a sense of the kind of, um, the kind of disturbing images and, and ideas that, um, that you encounter there. Um, I think it would be good to hear from you, Anik, what your thoughts are on, on what the impact of that is on, on researchers and how this starts to warp your own frame. Um, if you spend your life looking at some of the, um, looking, looking at the world through the lens of some of the conspiracy theorists themselves, um, often who are co-opting language that's, um, and methods of persuasion and <clears throat> explication that are um, kind of slightly distorted echoes of the same kinds of things that we do as journalists or that Bellingcat does um, when it's uh, explaining or um, unpacking its open source work. Um, how do you stay sane? Um, and uh, how, does, how do you think um, researchers deal uh, with some, some of the load that comes with, um, with doing this kind of, uh, I mean, we've, you've, the words, the term rabbit hole comes up a lot in these discussions. Um, so let's not try to avoid it. Let's just, let's, let's jump into it. Um, yeah, it'd be good to hear from you about that. Yeah, I think some of my friends would like to debate how sane I am, but um, no, uh, with my previous job, I, I worked with the Dutch National Police. I started out in uniform doing uh, the emergency calls, so uh, I firsthand saw what people can do to each other, but also all the misery that's out there. Um, and then later on, uh, I moved with open source teams and I analyzed um, uh, ISIS propaganda. 
Uh, I saw a lot of uh, decapitations and uh, other horrible stuff. Um, so, uh, at Bellingcat, we have, uh, and uh, also at Lighthouse, we have uh, people uh, helping us out, but when I started doing uh, QAnon work, because I know how to guard myself from uh, traumatizing footage, I don't use any uh, sound. Uh, I prepare myself for that. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm possibly gonna see people uh, who died, who are seriously injured. But QAnon is a whole different kind of mental health, to put it like that. Um, you're reading so many conspiracies, um, uh, people who deny uh, the deadly victims uh, in Ukraine who are say that there are uh, actors, but also uh, the, the example that Gabriel mentioned with uh, having children uh, drinking bleach to cause their autism, it makes you literally lose faith in the world, in humanity. Uh, some of these people are very highly educated and still they have certain beliefs, they keep denying that things happen. Um, so it's very important to sometimes take a break. Uh, we have deadlines, we have, uh, uh, we, we really want to uh, get to the bottom of a case, we want to tell the world what's out there, uh, educate other people, but sometimes just take a break and take back control. It's so important that if you enjoy to watch videos about puppies, uh, about food, or you, you need to reset your brain because at some point I thought, how can I keep reading this? Or if, how's the world gonna end if people honestly believe that this is true? And um, it's very important. Talk about it uh, to your colleagues. Um, Making yourself vulnerable, it's okay. You can tell other people that you've had enough, you don't wanna, you need to take a break. And I think especially with the, the big team we've been working on uh, on this subject. Um, yeah, I'm happy that uh, they're not only my colleagues, they're also my friends, uh, that I've been able to talk about it. And uh, yeah, I have a dark sense of humor. I don't think uh, sometimes I make remarks that people think, uh, you know, you're, you're down that rabbit hole and we're not sure you got out of it. But um, yeah, that humor really helps. I learned that from my previous job, even though I still think that maybe ambulance workers have even a darker humor, but I can fully understand. Um, yeah, so. Do what makes you happy at the end of the day of eight hours of reading QAnon uh, research and just take care of your mental health because it really has an impact. Thanks, uh, thanks, Anik. And I think it's, it's relevant because part of the goal of, of this project is to persuade some of the people in this room and many more people outside of this room um, that this kind of research is valuable um, and that it's doable um, by a broader community um, of researchers. Um, so I think it's a little irresponsible if you're telling people to, um, that they can do this and they should do this, um, not to at least discuss what it looks like when you start to do so. Um, we talked a little bit about structured questions. Um, I, I think when we talk about a topic like, uh, like QAnon and like viral conspiracy theories, in a panel setting it can all come across as quite dry and quite theoretical. Um, but Ultimately, what's fascinating about this is the real-world harms um, that can surface um, from, <clears throat> from the free circulation and growth of these, um, of these theories. Ross, um, you've done some thinking and some spotting um, of the ways in which um, QAnon narratives are interacting with, feeding off of, echoing and, and prompting um, public discourse political conversations um, in ways that are, are disturbing in an altogether different fashion. Could you explain a little bit um, what you've looked at and maybe give us some examples that give us a flavor of, um, of, of what's happening? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean the first thing to say is, is, um, <clears throat> this, is this is nothing particularly, particularly new. Um, I think um, politicians are as susceptible to conspiracy theories as, as the rest of us, um, and unfortunately we occasionally see this filter through 
into uh, mainstream political discourse. But again, we're, we're now looking, um, looking at this with the back, backdrop of four years of, of Donald Trump. And I, I, I think what's, um, I, 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 I think there's a problem when politicians realize that they can, they can make some political capital from this. If I, if I say things that, um, that, that QAnon adherents believe in, um, I might be able to get elected. Um, I don't necessarily want to see these people as, as policy makers. Um, I prefer my politicians to have some grasp on reality. Um, so, um, so in the United States, we've seen this already. Um, we've had Donald Trump, but we... Were, I mean, the Republicans are, are, are kind of pushing a, a slightly more extreme, extreme line in order to get um, in order to get re-elected, and and the um, and the Trump contingent, the Trump supporting contingent in the Republican Party is is, is still very strong. Um, as I say, my fear is that politicians in um, in Europe are going to look at that and say, "This is how we can become." A little bit more successful. Um, there are some signs of that. Um, I'm very focused on UK politics, given that I live in the UK. Um, about three or four weeks ago, um, at Prime Minister's questions, uh, Boris Johnson accused the leader of the opposition of um, protecting paedophiles. Um, this is language that has come straight out of the conspiracy playbook. Um, so what I get a sense of is that some of these populist um, politicians are testing the waters a little bit and seeing what they can what they can get away with. That's the problem. If we have um, if 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 we have politicians who are who are who are making political capital out of this and making decisions based on this, um, we're we're in real trouble. Um, so this underlines why we need to um, really keep an eye on these online communities, what they believe in, and see which of these conspiracy theories are making their way into a mainstream political discourse. Um, the Q constituency, uh, there are all sorts of actors that we've heard about from our panelists who recognize that the broader constituency of Q curious um, people. It can be a place to go and look for um, for potential uh, victims um, for confidence tricksters. Um, it can be a place to go and look for votes um, for reckless politicians. It can be a place to build public profiles um, for uh, for people who who want the attention. Um, it can perform a quasi-religious. Um, role in people's, in people's life. The Q constituency is, a, is, is of interest to a lot of, um, a lot of different actors. Um, and the interaction between current events and this broader Q community um, is obviously very intense because one of, one of the many different and complex drivers that, that, that push people towards conspiracy theories to begin with um, is is a distrust of mainstream media um, and their their growing sense that there's there's a, a hidden truth and narratives which then which they're not um, then which they're not getting delivered to them by by conventional um, by conventional media um, so we're talking about people who are very highly likely to be big consumers of um, of of current events and whose opinions are um, are directly impacted by current events. Um, we were underway and um, one of the joys of a project like this is that you get to work on it for a period of time before the findings, the outputs from it start to kind of break the surface. Um, and then vast, massive events. So we thought that one of the biggest things that we were going to be uh, going to have to do was to look at the intersection between Q and anti-vax, um, Q and the pandemic. Um, and that was the point where we thought, with good reason, that the pandemic would be 
the biggest news um, all the way through uh, the project that we were doing. And then something else happened that most of you will be aware of. Um, Gabriel, because of the work that we're doing, we were inside tracking these communities. Um, I, Logan gave us a sense a little bit of the scale of that observation post. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that we saw happen within the Q communities um, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Um, and maybe point out some of the slightly unexpected or maybe I think for some people here would be counterintuitive things that were observed um, there. And then I might come to the other panelists to pick up on some of the things that they found interesting um, in a similar vein. Sure. Um Russia's invasion of Ukraine was fascinating to watch on these Telegram channels because you saw you saw like um, a sense of of the, the the channels trying to figure out what the narrative should be or how they should interpret this event. So usually there's quite a consolidated narrative, right? There's the deep state, you know, the elites are all satanic pedophiles. But when Putin invaded uh, Ukraine, there was sort of uh, you saw different posts floating around with different interpretations of what was going on. And then after, I don't know, a few days, I would say like within 72 hours, there became a sort of consolidated, more consolidated narrative, at least in, in the European countries that uh, I've been present in, that um, Putin was invading Ukraine to, um, to fight the, the satanic elites um, and... What was also interesting, and this is something that Ross alluded to earlier, um, was the intersection between these telegram channels and Russian uh, state-funded media like RT. So what we saw um, was that RT was, uh, RT links were commonly shared in the telegram channels that, that we were in. Um, and there was also a very obvious bear baiting by uh, Russian um, officials, uh, like in the UN, uh, who would throw out these sort of lines, talking points like the bio labs in Ukraine, um, and uh, like truth behold, of course these telegram channels kind of went on fire, or the ones I was in at least, when he made this speech and they were you know, translating it into different languages, and um, so, in a sense, and, and this is something that we want to also analyze more when Logan has his uh, database and scraper up, it was fascinating to see the sort of microcosm of, of, of QAnon trying, of reacting to this big event and trying to decide what, how it actually wants to interpret it and um, what the sort of counter narrative is, is going to be. Um, so yeah, it, it, and, and still now, it, it, what's interesting as well is that the biolabs uh, conspiracy theory has been something that uh, Russian state media has actually been pushing for quite a long time, also in Georgia. Um, so I think it's been four years now that they've been trying to sow this narrative of, of biochemical weapons labs in Ukraine and Georgia. Um, so you could also kind of see um, that misinformation and propaganda now bubbling to the surface um, in a very visible way uh, when Putin decided to invade Ukraine. I mean, obviously, one of the things that's most interesting about that is it shows you um, the extent to which this broader Q constituency, which contains um, a lot of people who've come in for very different reasons, potentially from different backgrounds, different education profiles, it's recognized um, as essentially a, a, ra a radical community that can, um, that can tamper with narratives and contribute towards confusion um, in the countries that it's in. Um, what I found particularly striking from, um, from the recent events um, looked at from the standpoint of, the, of our QAnon research is that what Gabriel's just described with Russia opportunistically um, throwing out morsels that they know will be echoed and amplified within the Q community, um, something very different was happening inside the Russian Q community. Um, and Ross, there's a limit to what we can say about that because there are some things which are yet to be published. 
but you're in the room, so you get a sneak preview. Ross, can you give a sneak preview of what we saw? I can, I can give a sneak preview in, in very broad strokes um, because I've, I've talked to the researcher um, who's working on this, uh, Aganish, my colleague, and she's been looking at Russian language um, QAnon channels. And um, what she's found is, is, I mean, it was surprising to me, but really it makes sense that um, um, a lot of the QAnon supporters in Russia are actually against uh, Putin, um, which does make sense in the way that um, these people see themselves as standing up to, to power. Um, but yeah, that, that that is really what she's going to write about. I mean, the other the, the other thing as well that's that that we've looked at um, are mentions of Putin and biolabs um, before this this uh, invasion ever happened, because as Gabriel was saying, um, what we're trying to do is is get a sense of how the narrative switches in these. Um, in these uh, in these forums, um, as world events develop, um, what I, I found to be quite shocking um, is how quickly the the kind of false flag narrative has has embedded itself um, onto onto fairly mainstream uh, <clears throat> onto fairly mainstream platforms, um, Twitter and uh, Meta and, and 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 these types of platforms. Um, these these theories seem to be formulated on Telegram, um, and then they become uh, part of common kind of uh, political parlance. Um, so, from my point of view, that's that's the most shocking thing. But I think it's very uh, I think it's very important, and this is why this project is is um, so great, in my opinion, is that we can we have researchers who can look at um, Russian language conspiracy theories. As well, and it's just really, it's just really interesting to see how they they interpret interpret events. Um, so yeah, um, look out for that article. We've got at least, I'm going to say we've got at least one article on that, and maybe maybe a second as well. Um, but it's these little um, uh, kind of specialist niche um, subjects that that we're very interested in and perhaps uh, give a different perspective about what QAnon uh, really is. And thanks, Ross. Um, we talked a lot about this project, um, and I, as a journalist, I'm a little bit allergic to the word project. Um, I, so it might be sensible to tell you a little bit about what it's going to create um, and what the outcomes from this will be, what, it, what the offerings will be. Um, I'm going to kind of go in reverse order, working from, from the en end of this. So Logan has described that there will be a database. Um, there will be a, a public-facing dashboard. So um, the data for, that comes out of this project is going to be um, available to, to interact with um, and, um, and to ask your own questions of. Um, there is going to be a, an international conference um, in October. Um, now, when we started this, um, when we started uh, this work, one of the goals was uh, to understand this viral conspiracy a little bit, let's say, in the same way that epidemiologists might think about mapping out um, viruses in the way that they move around and try to understand why some European countries are more vulnerable to, to this virus of disinformation than others, and whether there might be some valuable lessons in that. Now, a lot of, a lot of policy makers and decision makers are grappling with disinformation um, and making policy decisions to try and combat it. Um, I've given a, a brief example. Um, one of a, a common way of trying to um, trying to curb uh, viral conspiracy theorists and, um, and disinformation is often to deplatform them. So one of the things that we hope to be able to do um, with, this, with this piece of work is to give policymakers and others an insight into what the effects of deplatforming are. How quickly do these communities then find new, um, new platforms and new places to congregate 
Um, how effective is deplatforming as a tool and what have the effects of that been? Um, so that conference is going to grapple with some of those bigger questions. Um, this month and um, a little bit into, into May, during April and May, there are going to be, um, there are going to be seven workshops. Um, and I will ask Anik in a minute to give you a little bit of a sense of what, what happens in one of these workshops, um, uh, where people are going to get, uh, where anybody can sign up and get training um, in some of the approaches that we've modeled um, during the course of this. Um, Ross has already mentioned that on Bellingcat's website, you're going to be seeing articles coming out which um, pick out some of the more interesting findings and explain some of the methodology behind that research. But at Lighthouse, all of our work um, reaches the public through our media partners. Um, so we will be doing a series of investigations that pick up some threads. It's a little bit difficult to talk about investigations that are not yet published, um, so there's a limit to what I can say um, on that at the moment. Um, but just to give a range of, of the, a, a sense of the range of different things that we're doing to try and take what we have learned um, on this journey into QAnon, which is still at its midway point, um, and then put that out in a way that engages different audiences and helps them to think um, about, um, about Q, the consequences of Q, um, and, um, and the impact of uh, viral conspiracies um, in this sense. Um, I'd like to finish up by getting Anik um, to explain a little bit about how the workshop series um, will work, and then the panel will be um, around up here, do come along. Um, unfortunately, we've been asked not to do a Q&A um, with, the, with the audience here. But if you do have any questions for any of the panelists, then do feel free to come up, introduce yourselves. Everyone here would be more than happy to, to have a chat about that. Um, yeah, so before, as a wrap up, I'm gonna turn to um, Anik to talk about that. And I'll just say thank you to Logan for coming up. Um, thanks to Gabriel and to, to Ross. And Anik, if you could wrap up by giving people who may not be at these a sense of what goes on in, in a QAnon, Europe's QAnon um, workshops. Yeah, I'll talk quick. I, I don't want to make the nice lady mad. Um, so within three more minutes, uh, our workshops are basically uh, an introduction into uh, a QAnon, uh, also uh, a terminology that's been used a lot because terminology doesn't matter if you do QAnon, uh, right wing, uh, you have to know the terminology to be able to do uh, your research proper. And like we said, um, a lot of them got uh, banned from Facebook, Twitter, the, the mainstream um, uh, and more uh, known uh, social media platforms. So what they just did is they either created their own platforms or moved to platforms like uh, uh, Gap, Parler. So we're going to be teaching how to do research on those platforms, but also um, the uh, uh, platforms like BitChute or uh, Odyssey, uh, where they share their messages in videos. So we're just going to do a, a, a good training on how to do research on the lesser known uh, alternative uh, platforms. And I just saw somebody in the corner of my eye. So I'm going to thank you all for your attention. And uh, yeah, please come up to us if you have any questions. And then I'm going to uh, wrap it up before I need to run for the thanks. nice lady. Thanks, everybody. Thank thanks you. Thanks for coming.